Well, now the first of tonight's cases. It's a callous and apparently motiveless murder. Eddie Uwusu was an attendant at one of the national car parks in London. On a Saturday night, nine weeks ago, he was shot while he was working. People from all over the country were using the car park that night. It serves a nearby theatre where Alice in Wonderland was playing. So if you were in that audience that Saturday, or if you were nearby, you might remember something which could just be the piece of information police need to find his killers. Our reconstruction starts on the morning of Saturday the 17th of January in Hammersmith, West London. Hammersmith Broadway. Underneath the flyover is the Sussex Place NCP car park where Eddie Owusu worked. That Saturday morning, Eddie arrived just before 10 o'clock to open up the kiosk for the day. It was bitterly cold that January weekend and there'd been snow and ice on the ground. Eddie, who was 46, had been the car park attendant here for five years. He came to Britain from Ghana in 1967 and his wife and three children followed later. He was a popular man and highly thought of by his employers at national car parks. We found him to be an excellent employee, someone who um, worked very, very hard at his job. A person that uh, I've always valued his, um, his work, his loyalty, his um, ability to do the job. Um, one of these people that you, you don't find everywhere, uh, an employee who I suppose you wish for. About a hundred yards away from the Sussex Place NCP is the Hammersmith Odeon, a popular music venue and theatre. The Odeon was preparing for a musical production by a Buddhist group, NSUK, that evening, Alice in Wonderland. Eddie usually took a break around lunchtime and often used to do the family shopping. This is probably what he did that Saturday. The Iwusu family lived in Plasto. Eddie and his wife Comfort were a devoted couple. They were well known and widely respected in the Ghanaian community. Ten to six that evening, a Ghanaian friend stopped by the kiosk. They spoke in a mixture of their native Asante and English. Long time no see. How is your heart? Not very good. It's, it's cold, so. I keep in most of the time. I, I'm yeah? on my way to see a friend, yeah. Why don't you come in for coffee? Ah, no, 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 thank you. I'm on my way to Richmond. I'm in a hurry. It's okay. a bit late, so I'll see you later. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Bye, guys. Take care. 7 p.m. At home in Dacre Road, Comfort Uwusu telephoned her husband at the kiosk. Hi, darling. Oh, hi. Is everything okay? Okay. Uh, look, um, we are very busy at the moment. The guys would need to come in. I'll call you back. Yes, I promise. I will. All right, don't work too hard now. <laughs> okay. I'll call you back. Bye. Speak to you later. Bye. At the car park, people were arriving for the evening's performance of Alice. Followers of NSUK had come from all over the country. The show was due to start at 8 p.m., but it wasn't until 8.20 that it actually got going. And outside, a few cars were still arriving at the Sussex Place car park, as late as a quarter to nine. Hammersmith Bridge Road, the bus stop for the 9, 33 and 72 buses. Waiting there were Ian Mole and three friends. Walking towards the bus stop was this man, Neil Blackgrove. He thought the noise was a car backfiring in the car park. Ian thought it was a shotgun. Go and get the police. He ran towards the car park kiosk. Eddie Awuso was lying on the ground, bleeding heavily. From the road, Neil saw two figures weaving between the parked cars. The one wearing a duffel coat seemed to be tucking something into the front of it. He watched as they ran from the car park across Hammersmith Bridge Road. A car heading towards Hammersmith Roundabout hooted at them as they dashed in front of it. 
they ran towards Angel Walk and disappeared. The door of Eddie's kiosk had been stove in, but there was still money lying on the counter. At home, comfort was never to get that call from Eddie. Eddie Iwusu died from gunshot wounds in the thigh at 2.27 the following morning. Well, Malcolm, you're looking for two killers with no apparent motive. Eddie was a very popular man, wasn't he? Very popular man. We think this was a robbery which, for some reason, went wrong. Even though money was left behind? We think that they discovered on entering the hut that the money was, in fact, kept in a safe in the floor of the hut and that Eddie did not have the key for the safe. And there were two shots. Do you think they intended to kill him? The very fact that there were two shots makes this a very brutal killing. That second shot was totally unnecessary. The first shot would have severely injured Eddie and he would have been beyond offering any resistance at all. So your appeal then is for anybody who might be able to offer any information about those two men, assuming they were men? Yes. Any close friend of theirs, associate, or particularly the partner in crime who may wish to tell us who the gunman is. The gunman is a very dangerous man. Well, to jog people's memory, let's have a reminder of the geography of the area, looking at our micro-map. Under the Hammersmith flyover there is the car park, and there's the kiosk where Eddie was shot. The Odeon is about 100 yards away, and the bus stop where Ian and his friends were is in Hammersmith Bridge Road there. And there's where Neil heard the gunshots, and that's uh, the route where the two killers ran after the shooting. They ran through the car park and then out and across the road. There's where they dashed in front of the car, and there's Angel Walk leading into King Street, which is the main shopping centre. And it's very busy round there, isn't it? Somebody surely must have seen them that night. In King Street, it was very busy. It's possible someone may have seen two men emerge, or two figures emerge from Angel Walk. The car park itself wasn't busy with people, but we would ask anyone in the vicinity of a car park or in the car park who saw anyone hanging round before the shooting, possibly from 8pm until 8.45, please to contact us because right. these men may have been reconnoitering the scene or just waiting round for a quiet moment before they attack the hut. And indeed the car driver who hooshes up and perhaps he'll come forward too. We would hope that he would come forward. There is a reward I gather. There is a reward offered by National Car Parks and it is a substantial reward. Right, well if there's anything you know that could help to find Eddie's killer or killers, please ring us in the studio now in absolute confidence. The number is 01 811 8055 or you can ring Hammersmith Police Direct on 01 748 4184. That's 01 748 4184. It's just over six weeks now since a private detective called Daniel Morgan was found dead in a car park of a pub in South London. It was gruesome. He'd been killed with an axe. The police described the case as a sticker. In other words, it's one they just can't solve. For nearly 30 hours, they did hold for questioning Daniel Morgan's partner, John Reese, and two of Reese's relations. And, as you may have read, three policemen were also questioned, but they've been eliminated from the murder inquiry. With nothing else to go on, maybe you can help. Our film starts in Sydenham, South London. Daniel Morgan loved the drama of being a private eye. He saw himself as a gumshoe in a TV series, and he liked to boast about the glamour of the job. Collecting bad debts or seeking evidence of a divorce case. But it did involve a lot of cloak and dagger work, and it could have made him many enemies. Apart from his work, Daniel Morgan's abiding interest was fast cars. He had several old ones kept in various places in South London, and he was devoted to his two young children. Come on, Daddy, come on! Daniel's colleagues describe him as a workaholic. It was nothing for him to drive in his BMW, to do a job in East Anglia, maybe go on to another in the Midlands, and perhaps manage a third in the West Country, all in a single day. They were mostly dirty jobs, though, that other people didn't want to do.
He specialised in what are known as motor snatchbacks, repossessing cars for which finance payments hadn't been maintained. Another bloody nutcase. Yeah, I had one of them yesterday. Uh, I've checked their figures. They seem OK. Daniel Morgan and his partner John Rees had been in business together for some six years, and it made them a good living. Just not out quite tonight. But it wasn't just the money. It was the excitement that made him work so hard. Summon serving, bailiffing, carrying out court orders, which are the stock in trade of the modern private detective. A lot of it caused distress, but he seemed to relish the almost unreal power it gave him. What do you want? You know what we want. It's all legal, and you've got to let her go. On the day before he died, Daniel left his office in High Street, Thornton Heath, at about five o'clock. He'd spent most of the day there, but police are anxious to know where he went for the next two hours. By eight that Monday evening, he was drinking in the Golden Lion pub in Sydenham with his partner, Jonathan Rees, and four other men. Large brandy, brandy and soda, a couple of pints of bitter, and uh, white wine and soda, one yourself. Next day, Tuesday, he and a colleague came back to the office at around 4.30 after spending the day in Slough. They were in buoyant mood when they went in to see one of their staff. Oh, you. Traffic on the bloody motorway, what do you think? Yeah. Anyway, I've got 16 warrants and some off for tomorrow. Good. I've got some money £70, £1,100. OK. That's right. At about 5.30, after making a few phone calls and with all the money in his pocket, Daniel left the office. He and John Rees had arranged to meet a contact later that evening, again in the Golden Lion. I'm off now, John. See you in the pub at 7.30. Okay. Yeah, OK. See you there. But Daniel had another appointment first. He met a woman here in Regan's Wine Bar in Brigstock Road, not far from his office. There were only a handful of other people there. Possibly someone was watching them. Daniel said he had to go early because he was due at the Golden Lion later on. The couple left the wine bar shortly after seven. Was he perhaps followed from here? If not, who else knew where he was going next? Only one other witness has been traced so far who saw Daniel between 7 and 7.30. Oh, Daniel, just the man. Could you give us a hand with the board? Cheers. Thank you. This is just near his office in Thornton Heath over. High Street. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Bye bye. John Rees had already parked his car at the front of the pub. Daniel Morgan put his car at the back. The man they were supposed to meet didn't turn up, and the two of them drank alone. One witness remembers two people of Mediterranean appearance looking intently through the window. There weren't many other drinkers in the saloon bar, though there was a ladies' darts team in the back room. Were you there that night? Yeah, might as well. The barmaid at the Golden Lion remembers Daniel buying his last round. Here we go, lad. Guess a white wine soda, brand new and coke. I want a couple packs of crisps, yeah? Right, I'm off then. See you tomorrow. John Rees told the police he left to go to his car at the front of the pub at about 9 p.m. He assumed Daniel was headed for the rear car park. But did Daniel go out the back way to the car park? And did he go with someone, or did he meet his killer in the dark? Close to his car, someone struck him from behind and then hit him three more times. 
Lying next to Daniel Morgan's body were the two packets of crisps, which police think were for his children. Douglas Campbell is looking for anyone who was in the Golden Lion in Sydenham Road on that evening, but uh, you're also trying to find who sold this axe. Now, this actually isn't the murder weapon. Now, that is a replica we bought, but it's identical to the murder weapon. And it has this uh, orange wax in the top here. Uh, it's Chinese. Or it's a Chinese origin. axe. They're imported into this country in the thousands, but it, what is more significant is the way it's taped. It's um, got two elastoplasts uh, on the handle. As though to be gripped, like that. That's right, as if to assist the grip or to stop the perspiration from somebody's hands allowing it to, sw to slip. I would ask anybody who saw that axe or sold it in the days leading up to the 10th of March or who saw it with the um, plaster on it to let me know. It might have been left in the back of a car or in a boot. Now, you have a photo in your possession. You're trying to trace the subject. Yes, we have a photo of a young lady. Um, it came into our possession and six weeks into the inquiry, we're still unable to identify her. She may be quite irrelevant, of course. Might have nothing to do with Danny Morgan at all, but I would ask the girl to come forward so at least we can eliminate her or know exactly who she is. And a watch was stolen. A Rolex watch was stolen from the uh, deceased body. Right, identical to this one. It is, a Rolex. OK, you believe that somebody must know, even though this could have been a, a, a loner, a loan attack. You believe somebody either knows or, or suspects... Well, in all major was. crimes, I feel that obviously there's the killer or the um, criminal, but there's always some other person who suspects that that person is responsible, and I would ask that person, in this case, to come forward to solve, help us solve this brutal killing. All right, well, the number to call here is 01811 8055, or you could call the Metropolitan Police at Sydenham on 01697 9212. That's 01 if you're outside London, 697 9112. Please now try to think back to what you were doing on the afternoon and the evening of Good Friday. Sometime on that first day of the Easter bank holiday, someone murdered a young woman by drowning and left her in a lake just outside Maidenhead in Berkshire. Now, you'll have read about it, the Shaney Warren case. It was one of those crimes that capture the front pages. In part, that was because Shaney was young, blonde and photogenic. But you may recall the headlines were fueled by an unfortunate public suggestion by one detective that Shaney may have committed suicide, and that despite the fact Shaney had been gagged and bound hand and foot. In fact, the night before the murder, Shaney, far from suffering depression, had seemed positively happy. Evening. On the Thursday before Easter, Roger Pell, an old boyfriend of Shaney's, had gone out with her for dinner in Maidenhead. They'd not met for several months. She'd rung him out of the blue. They both enjoyed the evening and arranged to meet again. In fact, you can do it like this. She seemed as happy <laughs> and relaxed as ever. I'll learn to master these, I will. Despite her late night, Shaney was up early on Good Friday and drove to Gerard's Cross to her parents' home she'd arranged to pick up an extension lead for her electric lawnmower. Shaney was 26, the youngest of three children. Her father, Joe, works from home. Her mother had gone that Easter weekend to the family flat in Bournemouth, where Joe and Shaney were due to join her on Sunday lunchtime. Here's the, uh, here's the lead. I've got a plug on it for you. Oh, and, uh, thank you, Dad. That should be long enough for what you want. Great, thank you. Just as she left, she wondered who should do the driving when they went down to Bournemouth on Sunday to join her mother. Her father agreed he'd pick Shaney up from home. OK. OK, Dad. Bye-bye. Mm. See you Sunday. OK, sweet. Mm. Take care. Uh, dry carefully. I will. See you Sunday. Shaney lived just 10 minutes from her parents at Stoke Poges, near Slough. It took her till early afternoon to mow both the back lawn and the front. She planned to take the clippings to the compost heap at her parents' home. Shaney shared her house with two lodgers, Katie and Fiona. All three girls potted round that afternoon, and Shaney seemed to have no firm plans for the evening. 
Well, I was tidying in my room. It must have been about six o'clock in the evening. I glanced outside of the window and Shaney was putting the grass cuttings and the black bin liners into the back of her car. And she got in the car and drove off down the close. Just as Shaney drove off, her mother phoned from Bournemouth but missed her. She never got the chance to speak to her again. Five miles from Shaney's home at the Taplow Lake Layby on the A4 outside Maidenhead. At about 10 to 7, someone saw a black car which seemed to be in difficulty. The Layby is used regularly as an overnight truck stop. About half past one, quarter to two, I came into the Layby from the far end. I saw the car, so I dipped my lights thinking it was a courting couple. Drove past it reversed in behind it, and the car was still there. there was, as I came to put a padlock on the back of my trailer, I noticed the door wasn't shut properly, but didn't think anything more of it, so I just went home then. The next morning, the driver, Donald Ward, returned to his trailer. It struck me as being odd that someone would leave an A-registered car with the door obviously not locked, but I assumed that it had broken down and that whoever owned it had gone for a recovery vehicle of some sort. But other than that, I didn't pay any great attention to it. Many Easter drivers may have stopped on this section of the A4. The lay-by is just five minutes from the centre of Maidenhead on the London side. If you did stop or even pass there, you might have seen the car. And the Paddington Reading railway line also gives a good view of the lay-by. Some 50 trains went past here between 6 and 9pm on that Good Friday. The car was still here the following afternoon. Me and my wife, Carol, was coming down this lane, Easter Saturday, about 2 o'clock, it's half one, two, and we saw the black Vauxhall. And the door was open about inch to two inches. And we just rode past, and um, about 45 minutes later, we turned around and came back, and the car was still there. At 6.30, a woman walking her dog discovered Shaney's body floating face down in the lake. She'd been gagged, her feet had been loosely bound with her own tow rope, a jump lead was round her hands behind her back. The other jump lead, later found in the lake, had been fastened round her neck. Shaney died by drowning. Forensic tests have failed to establish time of death, but it seems likely she died on the Good Friday evening. When police examined the Cavalier, the driver's seat was reclined and a blank card in an envelope was on the floor. Shaney's lighter was on the passenger seat. In front, on the floor, were the empty grass sacks and her watch. And under the steering column was an Easter egg intended for Roger Pell. Nearby, in the undergrowth, they found Shaney's credit card holder, her tow rope bag and a thank you card to Roger for the dinner on that Thursday night. When the police tried to move the car, they found it had gearbox problems. The Cavalier's shift selector had slipped and it could only be driven in third and fourth gear. The detective now in charge of the case is Superintendent John Childerly. Let's get this clear. We are now talking about a murder inquiry, not a suicide. We have always dealt with this as a murder inquiry from the very outset. Right. Now, there's no definite motive, is there? No, there is no injury to the body. There is no property that's been stolen, so there is no obvious murder. Yet there must have been thousands, literally thousands of potential witnesses. This is Good Friday, this is the, uh, the A4. Uh, there must have been thousands of people driving up and down between, well, after the hour of about 6 p.m. on that Friday evening. Yes, and we are interested in anybody who drove past that lay-by from 6 p.m. on Good Friday evening. As you say, it was a very busy period. We would like particularly anybody who saw vehicles driving into or out of the lay-by to come forward, anybody who saw the Black Cavalier in the lay-by, and anyone acting suspiciously in the area. Just so that people can get a fix on what that lay-by is, it's just the London side of Maidenhead. And it's actually a road in itself, isn't it? In fact, it was originally the A4. It's the old A4, which has now been bypassed and consists of about 300 yards of old road. In particular, obviously, you want anybody who has seen a car broken down there, anybody who went into that lay-by. There was a car seen broken down about a couple hundred yards away, wasn't there? Yes, there was a black saloon car about 200 yards maidenhead side of the lay-by with a bonnet up and a man looking under the bonnet. We'd be interested to trace this man because this car may, in fact, have been Shaney's vehicle, or if it not, we want to eliminate it. Right. 
Now, there are a whole series of other things. Um, she may have... Well, she must have dumped the grass cuttings somewhere. Now, thousands of people would have dumped grass cuttings on Good Friday. They'd have been out mowing their lawns. Anybody who looked like Shaney, you want well, to trade? Well, Shaney was a very attractive young lady, a blonde 26-year-old, driving a very smart car and the sort of person you would have looked at twice. We have no sightings of Shaney at present time from the, after she left home at 6 o'clock. She might, of course, have been seen making a phone call as well. That's, That's a possibility. If the car broke down in that lay-by, there are two phone boxes about a quarter of a mile either side of the lay-by where she could have made a call. This is a replica of a fob and her key ring. These, these are missing, the original missing. They are indeed. And we would like to trace these keys. We've made a search of the lake and the surrounding area, and it may be that someone has come across these keys and disposed of them, or perhaps they even know somebody who's got them in their possession. And obviously we'd be very interested in that. John Shelterly, thank you very much indeed. Uh, if you think you can help in any way, particularly if you've got any suspicions about anyone who acted oddly that night, it's Good Friday, remember. If you might have seen something relevant, if you have any thoughts, please don't just keep things to yourself. Our number, 018118055. This is live, so the detectives are here right now. Or you can ask for the Shaney Warren Incident Room on Slough 31282. That's 0753, the code for Slough. 31282. Tonight's final reconstruction is from Avon and Somerset, from the seaside town of Western Supermare. In the summer season, Western is a hugely popular holiday resort, attracting families from throughout the British Isles. A large number of people have settled there to retire, and two months ago, a 66-year-old resident was attacked in a wood nearby and killed. It was a Saturday morning at the end of March, a time of year when local residents had the place largely to themselves. The bay and beach at Weston are spectacular. At the north end, the old town overlooks the sea. And above the houses is Walbury Hill. Once the site of an ancient fortress, it dominates the town. The dense woods here are a great attraction to walkers and explorers. Whether exercising dogs or riding horses, hundreds of people come here every day. It's Saturday, March the 28th, down in Weston, number 38, Osborne Grove. It's nine o'clock in the morning, and Helen Fleet London is preparing for the day. The windy weather seems to have turned around, but the London Weather Centre tell us that conditions will still be pretty miserable when the boat race starts in about three hours' time. Helen was 66 and enjoying her retirement in the house that she and her sister Betty had bought four years before. A new look at another cricket immortal, Dr. W.G. Grace, revealed in a new play called The Champion. But at six minutes past nine o'clock, let's go down to the river now. Helen came originally from the north of England. She lived in Crewe until she was 18, just before the war. Helen joined the ATS and trained as a lorry driver. She then transferred to the Women's Royal Air Force. She fell in love with a Spitfire pilot who was killed in action over Italy. After the war, she married, but it didn't last. She married again, but 20 years ago was widowed. She found fulfillment when she took up a successful career organizing trade exhibitions for an Oxfordshire engineering firm. In retirement, her greatest joy was her two small dogs. Don't be a minute, minute loves. We go walkies. Be patient, good boys. Is there any activity on the river at the moment? Morning, Helen. Hello, dear. Hello, dogs. Need some tea. Will you be ready right after breakfast? Yes. Well, I'll drop you off on the way up to the woods. Helen intended to go to Walbury Hill to walk the dogs, but her sister wanted to go shopping for a blouse. Helen promised to drop her off and then pick up some bread they needed. And I might just buy you a couple of those donuts you're so fond of. <laughs> <laughs> Having dropped Betty off as planned, Helen got to the baker's in Milton Road at about 10.30. Bye, girls. Bye. Two loaves and two of those lovely donuts, please. To Eileen Fowler in the shop, Helen seemed her normal, cheery self. Jam one? Yes, please. At 10.50, Helen was seen parking at Walbury Hill Road. 
She parked in her normal spot. Come on, here we go. Walkie pockets, walkie pockets. Come on, do more, Cindy. Helen walked the dogs here twice a day, normally for over an hour. She suffered from emphysema, so she got tired quickly, but she still covered her usual route of about a mile. On a March morning, nearly everyone in the woods would be riding horses or, like Helen, walking dogs. But at around 11.30, these two girls noticed a young man in a ski jacket walking alone. 50 minutes later, at about 20 past 12, Helen was nearing the end of her walk. About then, three separate witnesses heard a series of piercing screams. <coughs> About the same time, below the woods, a boy almost fell over. He was running so fast down Prescott Close. 20 minutes later, a friend of Helen's, Sylvia Lewis, was starting her walk. As she let her dog off the lead, she saw Helen's two running free. Oh, hello, Cindy. Hello, Bill Bill. Hello. Come on then. Where's Helen then? Where's Helen? Come on, show me where she is. Helen. Helen. 50 yards away, a boy in an anorak was seen by a witness who was waiting for a bus to leave. Well, you have to wait until the you know, leaving time, which is about four minutes. Oh, thank you. She's lying in the wood. I think she's been attacked. Right. Please, right. could you come and help me? Helen had been beaten, she'd been stabbed and strangled. The investigating officer is Ray Sargentson. Not only a very, very violent attack on her, but apparently quite motiveless. That's right, a very vicious attack on a frail lady, totally unable to defend herself, who in addition to being stra stabbed, beaten about the body, was also strangled. Now, the great priority, obviously, is to find those young men in anorak, ski jackets or, or wh whatever, who were in the wood on that day, haven't yet been interviewed. Yes, indeed, yes. It's Saturday the 28th of May. Obviously, all young people who are in that wood, anybody under the age of, what, 22, 23, should it, come forward. Yes, anybody in, in the wood. On the 28th of March, uh, who was in the wood during the times of between 10.45 and 12.30, should come forward. With a large number of people that we haven't yet traced who we know were in the woods during the time. I gather something like 70 people who were in the woods, you think, who haven't yet come forward. That's right. From other wit statements of other witnesses, they've told us... That descriptions of persons walking dogs, we have not traced up to 70 people who are in the woods on the morning of the 28th of March. Right, and in fact, I know you're trace, trying to trace another young man and very badly needed him to come forward who was seen two days earlier on the Thursday. Yes, we traced a witness about the sixth week of the inquiry who spoke to the deceased two days before her death in Worldly Woods. He was asking the whereabouts of some of his work. He was driving a van? He was driving a van, and Mrs... Fleet was stood there, and nearby was a youth, and this is the only sight and we've ever got of the deceased with a single youth. She basically only spoke to other persons walking dogs. Right, this is about ten past four on Thursday, 26th of March. Yes, that's right. Now, obviously, somebody may have suspicions about somebody. Um, you've got a photo, a video fit, actually, a computer-enhanced uh, video fit of that youngster who was seen two days before. We don't know that that guy has anything to do with the crime. You just want to eliminate him, yeah? Yes, certainly do. He's a very important witness. He's been seen speaking to the deceased, and we clearly do want to eliminate him from the inquiry. 
somebody, of course, may be shielding someone. They may have suspicions about someone who acted oddly. Yes, the viciousness of the murder leads us to believe that somebody will be acting in an irrational or unusual manner. And we plead to anybody who knows any person, whether in their family or not, to come forward and supply us with the information. All right. Incidentally, I might say that when we did that reconstruction, you heard all those screams. Nobody rang the police and nobody came to investigate. Let me also say, incidentally, the two dogs have been found a good home. Don't ring us about that. But if you have any suspicions about who might have done this thing, terribly important you act quickly. Please do call us. You can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. The number, of course, 01811 8055. Or dial the incident room at Western Supermare, Western Supermare 25411. That's 0934, the code for Western Supermare, 25411. The first of this month's reconstructions tells the story of a 25-year-old woman who lived alone in a bedsit at Tunbridge Wells in Kent. Wendy Nell was murdered there one Monday night in June. What's especially tragic about this case is that several people had seen prowlers in the district, but they hadn't reported them to the police. And there's a mystery about Wendy that maybe you can solve. The date is Monday, June the 22nd. Number 14, Guildford Road, in Tunbridge Wells, that Monday morning. At 8.30, as usual, Wendy Nell left her bedsit for her 15-minute walk to work. Wendy was manageress of Super Snaps in Camden Road. That Monday, a new assistant had started, and Wendy took her through the routine. Make sure they've got K34 on all of them. And what's that? That's the shop number. Right. Put them in alphabetical order, mm -hmm. and then into the main tray. Wendy was good at her job, and happy there. Friendly and efficient, and popular with all the staff. All right. Call me if you need me. OK, then. Wendy visited a customer, then at about quarter past one, went to her bank and building society. Did she meet anyone else? After work, at six o'clock, Wendy went home to collect some laundry. Her bedsit was tiny and run down. In fact, she disliked it so much she rarely allowed anyone to visit, and she spent very little time there. When she left, she left the window open. In fact, it wouldn't close because the latch had been painted over. There was easy access to the back of her house, which was divided into nine small bedsits. Her ground floor room backed onto a poorly lit alleyway. There'd been several nighttime prowlers and peeping toms, and 24 hours earlier, there'd been a strange incident at a house less than 50 yards away. A 19-year-old was alone in her second-floor flat on that Sunday evening. Yes? You shouldn't leave your window open, especially in the bedroom. This is a Crime Watch video fit of the man, compiled by the witness. By eight o'clock on the Monday evening, Wendy was finishing her washing in the Rastall Laundrette, a couple of miles from her home. Fred Astaire is dead. The Wendy's boyfriend, Ian, lived close by with his mother, and for the rest of the evening, the three of them watched TV together. 10.30, back in the alleyway behind Guildford Road. Someone who lived in the same house as Wendy saw a man trying to peep through a window in the house directly opposite. The prowler watched for some minutes before he was disturbed. The police weren't called. Three quarters of an hour later, at 11.15, Wendy was taken home by her boyfriend, Ian.
Wendy died from a blow to the head sometime before 5 a.m. Local residents recalled two events that night. At 12.30, a peeping Tom was spotted outside a house in nearby Grove Hill Road. And at 10 past one in Guildford Road, neighbors remember a car, possibly a blue Talbot Horizon, having difficulty starting outside Wendy's house. At 12 o'clock, BBC Radio Kent News with Michael Bath. Police today issued a fresh appeal for witnesses following the murder of the Tunbridge Wells shop manageress Wendy Nell earlier this week. Wendy, who was 25, was found battered to death in her bedsit in Guildford Road. Two days after Wendy's death, a new witness, a local shopkeeper, came forward with evidence which opened a whole new line of inquiry. Bits and Pieces is a second-hand goods shop specialising in collector's items. The owner believes Wendy was a regular visitor. Oh, hello. Hello. Come for your train, then? Yes. Over a period of nine months, Wendy had visited the shop about once a fortnight, always to buy or look at model trains. That'll be four pounds, then. Assuming it was Wendy, none of the trains she bought has ever been found. Wendy didn't keep them for herself, so to whom did she give them? Ma'am, in charge of seeking Wendy's killer is Richard Rickson. Was that Wendy? Well, I want to be sure that the customer was Wendy Nell, and I would appeal to any viewer who recognises herself in that reconstruction to ring us tonight. If it was Wendy, then what was she doing with the trains? Who did she buy them for? Where are they now? Now, she was in the habit of buying carriages, not locomotives. They were all OO gauge, or their continental equivalent. Yes, all trying or Hornby make, and over a period of nine months, she bought perhaps a dozen of them. She purchased this model before, on the Friday before she died. It's a Fleischmann make. It's a German carriage, identical in every respect to this one, apart from the colour. The one she bought was a single colour maroon. Now, I gather that several things are missing from her flat, in particular her diary and her keys. Her diary, of course, would have her name in it, Wendy Nell. The keys are quite uh, distinctive. This, uh, this key ring is, is yes, very uh, odd. The key fob she brought back from a recent holiday in Austria, and we certainly know that the brass Woman of the Year tag was attached to the key ring, as were the two keys you see um, in, in these. Now... Was her killer, do you think, someone she knew, or was this an opportunist crime? Do you know? Well, I'm hoping that a telephone call tonight will answer that question for us. The man who went to that woman's house nearby the night before and said, you shouldn't keep your window open, that very odd thing very to do. Very strange incident. got a video fit of him. Perhaps you could describe him to us. Yes, that man is um, in his mid-twenties. He's over six foot tall and very thinly built. He's got short, dark hair and a tidy moustache. And that was about half past six on Sunday the 21st. Now, obviously, if that man is entirely innocent of the murder, he would do well to call you and, and yes, say Yes, he so. would. It's essential that we trace that man. Right. Also, that car, that blue or possibly blue or greyish car that was outside her house about one o'clock on, on that, uh, the morning that she died, again, that might be entirely innocent. Whoever was driving a car away from Guildford Street in Tunbridge Wells that night ought to come forward. Yes, we need to eliminate that. It was a light blue or grey Talbot horizon. It left Guildford Road. Did anybody see it leaving Guildford Road? Or did you see it arrive near where you live sometime in the early hours of Tuesday, the 23rd of June this year? Superintendent Rickson, thank you very much. Please do call us if you can help. It's terribly important. Call right now. Here's the number, 01811 That's 01811 or you can dial the incident room at Tunbridge Wells. That's Tunbridge Wells 511055. The code for Tunbridge Wells is 0892 511.
0055.